It's a real pleasure to be here in not-so-sunny Stockholm and to be speaking at this event. So I've been really excited about this for a number of months. What I want to do today is to discuss, to pick apart, one of the most misused false dichotomies in current usage within our media and our political classes. Now, this is where they say there is a balance between uh, privacy and security. And I want to pick that apart and explain why it is wrong and why perhaps we need to think about some of our basic rights in a new way. And I say this coming from um, a rather unusual background. I have seen the application of these sort of arguments from both sides. I was an intelligence officer with MI5 in the 1990s, and I was the person sitting behind a desk deciding who was going to be listened to, whose letters and communications were going to be read, um, I would be the one with that power, and I would then be the one reading your communications. So I know quite how all-intrusive, all-invasive that process can be. You get to see everything about someone's life. But I also see it from the other side, too, because I did blow the whistle. I was involved in that process in the 1990s. And after that um, step, I have spent the rest of my life not being able to guarantee that I have any privacy in my own life that I cannot have private telephone calls or private emails or even privacy in my own home. And that has repercussions not just for myself, but also for my family. My mother is here today, Michelle, and she has had to learn the hard way what it is like not to be able to speak about family issues, private family matters, health issues, money issues, without me constantly flapping down the phone saying, don't mention that, don't mention that. And it's very wearing for her. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what it's like being a spy and then also what it's like to blow the whistle, go on the run and face all the court cases because I think this is quite a current issue now, particularly post-Snowden. He has gone through exactly the same process. But then I want to broaden that out from the personal to the wider political and deconstruct that false dichotomy of privacy versus security. So I started working in MI5 in the 1990s this was the only decade in the hundred years of existence of the spies. Excuse me, I think it's playing up a little bit. Is it? It is. Thank you. That's better. <laughs> Never wear big earrings when you're giving a talk. Of course, this could be a bug. <laughs> <laughs> so, to go back to the story, I was recruited in 1990 as an intelligence officer. And at that point, it was just after MI5 had been put on a legal footing for the first time in its 80 years' existence. Up till that point, they weren't covered by the laws. Our MPs couldn't ask questions about them. They didn't know what they were getting up to, and indeed, MI5 was getting up to pretty much what it wanted. As a very famous 1980s whistleblower called Peter Wright said in his book, Spycatcher, they could bug and burgle their way around London with impunity, and they did. After a series of whistleblowing scandals in the 1980s, they were put on a legal footing, and this is when I was recruited. They wanted a new generation of intelligence officers to work as counter-terrorism officers. Up till that point, they had focused on political activism and counter-espionage. And um, I didn't mean to be a spy. In fact, they had a really bad reputation at that point, so I was really not interested at all. But I had this um, yen to be a diplomat. I quite fancied swanning around embassy parties, swilling champagne around the world stage. So I applied to our foreign office, and then a few months later, I had a letter saying there may be other jobs you would find more interesting. And this letter came from our Ministry of Defence. Now, I don't know why at that point, but my very first gut instinct was, oh my God, it's MI5. And I was really frightened. I was going to ignore this letter, but unfortunately, my father was in the room when I opened the letter. And my father was a spy geek. He just loved all that stuff like John le Carre. And crucially, he was also a journalist. So he said, oh, please just ring them up, see if you're right, see if it is MI5. So at least ever after, I've been able to say that it was all your fault, Dad. Look what happened. It's always good to be able to blame the parents. So I applied and went through 10 months of very, very intensive recruitment. 
And my views then around things like ethics and politics were not much different than they are now. I was very honest about them. And they still kept taking me back to the next stage and reassuring me and saying they had to obey the law and that they wanted people to work on terrorism targets. So it sounded like a good job in the end, and I joined. And I was there for six years, and I had three postings during that time. First of all, looking at the very area of work they had promised me they were no longer doing as the Cold War was over, which was political activism. They called it counter-subversion. Then I worked in the Irish section, and then I worked on international terrorism before resigning to blow the whistle. In my very first section there, I met a man who became my partner as well, David Shaler, and he became the primary whistleblower during this process. So just very quickly to run over what we saw going wrong, why we took the fatal step to go public. In the counter-subversion section, we saw a whole range of files on UK citizens for their legitimate political activity. And people could get a file for the simplest of reasons. So, for example, um, you could be a friend of someone who might possibly be a member of the Communist Party. There were files opened on school children who wanted to get some information about the Communist Party. So they wrote to the Communist Party HQ, and that letter was intercepted, and they had a file opened on them because they were deemed to be a threat to British national security. We also saw, as well, a series of files on government ministers, the very people the politicians who are supposed to be the political masters of our spy agencies in the UK. In T Branch, which was the Irish section, we saw a range of operations that failed, that could and should have prevented bombs going off on British streets. But MI5 and the police made mistakes, and those bombs exploded, and in some cases, not only caused massive structural damage in the UK, but also killed innocent people. That was bad enough, but MI5 refused to learn from their mistakes. And in fact, they would cover them up, they would lie about their mistakes to government. So next time you hear your politicians saying, oh, we know, we know what our spies are doing, they're obeying the law, they don't have a clue, because it's very easy for the spies to game the process and lie to their political masters. Finally, we worked in the, uh, the international terrorism section. And this is where we saw the cases that made us quit. Just to summarize, there was an illegal telephone tap on a very prominent left-wing journalist in the UK, so no change there. There was also the case of two innocent students being arrested and tried and convicted for a terrorist attack in London in 1994, which they were innocent of. And MI5 withheld the crucial documentation that would have proven their innocence during their trial. These two young people, received 15-year sentences, and they served most of that time. And finally, this was when David was the head of the Libyan section in MI5. He was briefed about an unfolding plot in MI6, which is our James Bond foreign intelligence gathering agency. And he was briefed by his counterpart, whose um, snappy code number was not 007, it was PT16B. And this was in 1995, and PT-16B was terribly excited because they had received a volunteer, a walk-in, as they called it, a Libyan military intelligence officer who went to the British Embassy in Tunis and said, I have a group who want to try and depose Gaddafi. They were Islamic extremist groups at that time, Al-Qaeda affiliates, which MI5 was already investigating, but MI6 decided to help them. And they shoved loads of money at this group and resources in order for the group to carry out its coup attempt. And David was very concerned about this. He thought it was some sort of James Bond fantasy. I mean, MI6 were always coming up with these crackpot schemes and never actually really doing much. But he was concerned, because this looked like a very dangerous operation to get involved in. And lo and behold, it did happen. In early 1996, he saw a series of different intelligence reports coming across his desk, which said there had indeed been an attack against Gaddafi. When he was traveling in a cavalcade of cars, there had been an explosion under a car. But of course, it was the wrong car, because Gaddafi survived to be assassinated by the very same groups in 2011. However, the people in the car were not so lucky. They were killed. And innocent bystanders were also killed in the ensuing security shootout. So what we had there was our foreign intelligence spy agency, MI6, funding our known terrorist enemies 
to carry out an illegal assassination plot against a foreign head of state which goes wrong and kills innocent people. How much worse can things get? <laughs> so this was the case that made us quit, and we had took the step to go public about that primarily, but all the other concerns we had too. We had tried to raise our concerns internally, but we were always told to shut up and just follow orders. So we went to the press. This was in 1996, and it took a long time for the story to build. Eventually, in 97, it broke, and we did, I suppose, an Edward Snowden in 1997. We had three days' warning, and we fled the UK, because under the terms of the Official Secrets Act in the UK, if you work for the spies and you say anything ever to anyone outside the spy agencies, you are automatically the criminal. You face two years in prison at least. And we, couldn't, we didn't want that. We wanted to stay at liberty to argue our case, just as Edward Snowden did get out before the story breaks and remain at liberty to argue the case because you are the ones who know the detail and know it inside out. So we fled. We went literally on the run around Europe. Um, we fled to uh, the Netherlands and then down through France and Spain in some sort of surreal backpacking holiday. After a month of this, I returned to the UK because I, know, I knew that I needed to sort out our possessions in our home, I needed to talk to our traumatized families who had no warning whatsoever that we were going to do this. In fact, the first that they heard of it was when they saw the front pages of the newspapers. I went back and I was automatically arrested, purely for being Shayla's partner. They questioned me in a counterterrorism suite for six hours and they kept me on police bail for six months, but they never charged me with any crime. They also swept up his brother, his two best friends, and as the years progressed, they arrested student activists who supported him, and they arrested and threatened a number of journalists who dared to cover his disclosures. In fact, one journalist ended up with a conviction for breaking one of the stories. So this case grew and grew, and in fact, David Shaler ended up going to prison, not once, but twice. First of all, when the British failed to extradite him from France to stand trial for a breach of the Official Secrets Act in 1998, he went to prison pending the hearing and was banged up in the notorious La Santé prison in Paris for almost four months. Then we had two years in Paris. I have to say, if you ever have to go on the run and live in exile, I recommend Paris as the city to go to. The French certainly had very good whistleblower protection back then. I'm not quite sure how good it is now. But we had two more years before he returned voluntarily to face trial, knowing that he would automatically have to do so. And we thought, well, you know, at least he'll get his day in court. He'll be able to put the Gaddafi plot details into the public record. Unfortunately, it didn't work out quite like that. We went through over two years of pre-trial hearings where what he could say in his own defense in front of a jury of his peers was narrowed down and narrowed down and narrowed down until by the time the trial started at the Old Bailey, he was not allowed to say anything in his defense. He couldn't say why he'd done what he'd done. He couldn't even mention the Gaddafi plot, which was actually injuncted. It was banned. The media were not allowed to discuss it for the six-week period of his trial. So it was a bit of a kangaroo court, and of course he was convicted, and of course he was sentenced. The only time either of us in this whole legal process was ever allowed to say why we had done what we'd done was when I stood up after he was convicted to give the mitigation plea. And the judge accepted what I said, and his final verdict was, Mr. Shaler had done what he'd done in the public interest, that there had been no financial motivation, and that no agent lives had been put at risk during his disclosures. Fair enough. Until the next morning, when I looked at all the newspapers and the headlines said, Shaler sells agent lives down the river for money. Now, where did that come from? Who were the journalists in the court writing this down? So that was all a bit sad. He ended up doing six months. He had a six-month sentence, um, which, compared to, <clears throat> compared to what a lot of the American whistleblowers are now facing, 35 years in prison with Chelsea Manning, doesn't seem too bad. But I can assure you, the act of standing up and following your conscience and then still having to go to prison for however little or how long is a terribly high price to pay. So from all this, we learnt a few very important lessons, I think. First of all was one, how can the media, our mainstream media, be manipulated to quite such a degree by the spy agencies? 
And I'd just like to explore this a little, because we are still seeing the same degree of manipulation coming out now with issues around the war on terror in the Middle East and ISIS and when we went into Libya, or even with Ukraine at the moment as well. How do these agencies, how do the governments control the media message? Well, one way, certainly in the UK, is through soft power. They will induct journalists, favoured journalists, into their secret charm circle and feed them nice stories. So the journalist becomes dependent on this relationship. And then they can be asked to perhaps tip off the spies if there might be an embarrassing story coming out, or massage stories to suit the spy agenda. And then in the UK particularly, we see higher level connections between the editors of newsrooms and the proprietors of media organizations and top spies and, sto and top politicians and top police. And this has been laid bare in gruesome detail with the uh, Rupert Murdoch phone hacking scandals over the last few years too. You can see the interlinkage and the way that the establishment was controlling the news agenda. So that's the soft power. On the other side of it, in the UK, we have a whole battery of laws to control and threaten our mainstream media. In fact, the spies in the UK are probably the least accountable and most legally protected in any Western, agent, in any Western democracy. So we have a situation where they can use the terrorism laws to stifle journalists, and they have where they can injunct them, stop them reporting, where they can put out super injunctions, which means they can't even report the fact they've been gagged. And then the government has its own versions called Public Interest Immunity Certificates, BIIs. We have the most draconian libel laws anywhere in the Western world, and we are notorious for our libel tourism. And then, crucially, we have the good old Official Secrets Act, 1989. So, in the UK, we have two acts. The 1911 Act is to stop traitors, and if you are caught and charged under that act, you will get 14 years minimum. However, the 1989 Act, which is the applicable, applicable one now, was actually put in place to stop whistleblowing. So, this is where people like David Shaler can be charged and face up to two years per charge under that law. Crucially, though, it also has a Section 5, which means that journalists who cover whistleblowers coming out of the intelligence agencies can also face two years in prison. This is more draconian under the law than even in Russia, where if someone reports a whistleblower, the whistleblower will go to prison, sure, but the journalist cannot be formally charged. They can be shot, of course, which seems to happen quite regularly. Bit of a high price to pay, but legally they are more protected than the UK. So, as I said, the spies are very, very well protected. There is some notional oversight in the UK. We have something called the Intelligence and Security Committee in Parliament, which up until this year was only allowed to look at policy, finance and administration. This year they have a few more powers to investigate operational issues, but I'm not holding my breath that they will hold the spies to account, because after Snowden came out with all his extraordinary disclosures of how GCHQ, our listening post, had been prostituting itself to the NSA over the last few years, basically selling its services to the NSA for about $100 million and saying, come and use us. We are not regulated in the same way as you. Let us do your dirty work. And they have. And yet, the Intelligence and Security Committee people immediately leapt to the defense of GCHQ, saying, no, no, we know they obey the law. We know what they get up to. That's not quite the case. So this takes me on to the wider issues now, I think. Two areas I want to look at out of my four wars that Anne-Marie mentioned. First of all, the war on the internet, and what it means for all of us. And secondly, the war on whistleblowers, because there will be more, and how we should approach it as active and informed citizens. So with the war on the internet, we have a situation where the spies in the 1990s saw a golden opportunity for total surveillance. After the Cold War, the America found itself as the only superpower left standing. And America also happened to be the cauldron of all the new startups, all the new internet companies. So they could see this perfect golden opportunity, this perfect storm of opportunities to get in there quickly, to build up the infrastructure, the mechanisms by which the back doors by which the spies could grab our information 
And that's where it started. Now, of course, we have, thanks to Edward Snowden, a very in-depth knowledge of the sheer scale of what they're doing. I mean, the very first disclosure was PRISM, pulling all our metadata. And that argument has been well thrashed out that you can put together a very clear picture of someone's life purely from their metadata. But then, of course, we get nastier things coming out, like the Tempera program. How many of you have heard of that one? Not many. Our media, you see, can't trust them to report this stuff properly. Tempera is a GCHQ operation in the UK. And in this operation, they mainline all the information that travels on the fiber optic cables between North America and Europe. It's like sucking on a fire hydrant of information. And they grab it all and they keep it. Now, our politicians, who are supposedly the political masters of the intelligence agencies, say, that's fine. We have signed a warrant. It's all democratic, it's all legal. We know what our spies are doing. It's not, though, because the warrantry system is designed, was written and designed in the 20th century. It's an analog law. And it is only there for the politicians to sign a warrant and say, we want to listen to the communications of this targeted person for these reasons, or this targeted group for these reasons. It is not there for the agency to say, we want to listen to all the communications of an entire country. And even if that were possible, even if our foreign secretary, for example, could legally sign off on such a vast warrant infringing the privacy of every citizen in the UK, where does he get off on saying that he has the authority to do this for the whole of Europe? Because this is what Tempera is grabbing. Not just the UK data, but the whole of Europe's data. 500 million of us are apparently allowed to have all our information gathered by GCHQ because the Foreign Secretary of the UK one day signed a warrant in his office. Now, you might think, well, it doesn't matter, I'm doing nothing wrong, I've got nothing to hide. But I think that argument is bogus. How many of you have heard of another operation Snowden disclosed, which is called Optic Nerve? This is a more recent one. One, <laughs> dear. This is when you use Yahoo video conference calling. Now, it turns out that optic nerve means GCHQ can grab the images and the conversation when you, have, when you use this facility, and they can probably do it with Skype and other VoIP too. Under these terms, they can see everything that you do during the conversation. And it turns out that 10% of us use these facilities to have, shall we say, um, intimate conversations with our long-distance partners. And these are very explicit images, apparently. And the poor little darlings in GCHQ are given counselling to deal with the trauma of watching all these X-rated conversations. So you're not doing anything wrong. You're having a, a valid, if you know, explicit conversation with your loved one in a consensual adult relationship. But how many of you would feel comfortable knowing the spies are poring over that sort of imagery? Now, I'm not going to ask how many of you might have had that sort of conversation. <laughs> But if you have, <laughs> I would think about it in future. So that's, that argument around not doing anything wrong is bogus. We also, and I think Cory Doctorow yesterday expressed it so well, we have a sort of perfect storm of opportunity that has arisen. Because the spies have all these tools now to watch us, the state-level spies, and they cooperate completely, particularly the Five Eyes group, which is America, Canada, the UK, uh, New Zealand, and Australia. They share everything. So even if they can't do something in their own backyard, they can ask one of their chums, GCHQ, for example, to grab it for them and give it to them. That is a global panopticon. We are all vulnerable. But also, we have the copyright wars, the intellectual property wars that Cory Doctorow mentioned yesterday, where the big entertainment corporations and the big pharmaceutical organizations and organized companies like Monsanto want to protect their intellectual property. And this is not just about grabbing the odd film of Pirate Bay. This is also patents, uh, medicines, foods even, that Monsanto wants to patent. And they will say, we have to protect our patents. We have to have access right into the depths of the internet catch people who might be trying to, you know, grab this information. And they go really deep. I mean, they are the ones who've pushed for deep packet inspection level surveillance. So on the one hand, you have 
this sort of intellectual property wars being used as a justification by the lobbyists of all these big mega corporations, pushing through legislation like the Transatlantic Trade Invest Investment Partnership, TTIP, which, if this goes through, and it won't be read and approved by the vast majority of our members of, in the European Parliament, they will just have to sign it without reading it. If this goes through, will mean that these mega corporations will have more power than our national governments in Europe. If, for example, Sweden decides it doesn't want to use GM food, Monsanto could sue Sweden as a nation and say, you are inhibiting our potential future profits from the use of GM food, for example, in this country. And they will sue Sweden for those lost profits, and they will win if TTIP goes through. So we have these mega corporations trying to use the threat of piracy as a way of con controlling what information we can freely exchange over the internet. And then we also have our nation state spies controlling um, at the free flow of that information, grabbing that information. And this is where the privacy security argument really breaks down, in my view. Because if you cannot guarantee that you have a private conversation, for whatever reason, you know, you're being investigated for piracy, you're being investigated for your political affiliations or something by the state-level spies, then you can't guarantee you have privacy. At that point, you begin to self-censor. You won't write freely, you won't read, watch, plan, organize, activate, have a relationship freely on the internet. And once you lose that sense of privacy, and you lose that freedom, you lose the ability, if things go bad, if there are economic crashes or uh, riots on the street, or um, you get a really bad government that you want to activate against and take action against as a concerned citizen, then suddenly you will be self-censoring. I think this was called yesterday in one of the talks, the um, anaconda in the chandelier. You self-censor and cannot operate as an informed, active and participatory citizen of your country. And that way lies the slide towards totalitarianism, to police states. And that, of course, is a lesson very hard won in countries like Germany, both with the Gestapo and, of course, more recently with the Stasi. So this is why I think we need to be very aware, and I hope there are many people in the audience today who are already thinking along the lines of this, that we need pushback against this massive surveillance, that we need to activate and campaign against the uh, fasc fascistic growth of corporate influence. And here I'm quoting Benito Mussolini, the Italian dictator, who said very famously that fascism is the merger of the corporate and the state. And I would suggest, with the war on the internet, that is precisely what we are seeing today. So just to wrap up, looking very quickly at the war on whistleblowers, we have seen many, many whistleblowers coming out now. No matter how draconian the punishment, particularly in America, where most whistleblowers face 35 years in prison, over the last decade, we have had a number of them coming out, from particularly the NSA, uh, William Binney, Kurt Wieber, um, Thomas Drake, and, of course, Edward Snowden. Knowing what they risk, knowing what they face, knowing that they will see their reputations shredded in the compliant media, and knowing that they will certainly lose their professional status, their ability to earn a living, and very probably their liberty too. And yet they are doing us a service. They are letting us know they are the regulators of last resort when the oversight mechanisms fail, when the spies run out of control, run amok, and invade our privacy. So next time you see someone coming out, and I have no doubt there are more, there may even be a few potential whistleblowers sitting here today who say, no, enough is enough. We have a system of universal rights put in place, of which privacy is one of the key rights. And it was put in place after World War II to stop such horrors ever happening again. We have those rights for a reason. We need to uphold those rights. We cannot guarantee that the spies will uphold those rights or even obey the laws under which they are supposed to operate. And if that is the case, we need whistleblowers and we need to support them. And we need to enable them as well by developing privacy tools for communication over the internet. The only reason that Edward Snowden is still at liberty is because he knew precisely with his tech background how to avoid capture before he can make an impact. And we need to develop tools to enable future whistleblowers and, of course, privacy tools to protect our own privacy in our own lives too. Which is why, at the very minimum, I would recommend open source PGP, 
use tall, the onion router, use tails, all those sort of things, just because you can't guarantee that our governments really know what the spies get up to. And we can't guarantee the spies will obey the law. We can try and tighten up those laws, and we should as concerned citizens. But we need to take the right to privacy into our own hands. It is a right and a responsibility as citizens. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Annie. Thank you. That was an inspiring, inspiring speech. Um, I was thinking, uh, you know, that we had a strong debate a couple of years ago in Sweden about surveillance acts that mm -hmm. the government put through. And since then, we have had, as you say, whistleblowers like Snowden. And my personal worry is that people are, trying, are starting to get a bit exhausted mm -hmm. on discuss. I mean, we love lolcats. We don't want to discuss this ugly dirty laundry, as you were talking about. How do we change the opinion so we will get back to this activate sort of face in people's <laughs> mind? I think that's the $64 billion question these days. Um, one is just to put the information out there more about the context within which someone like Edward Snowden is trying to do what he's doing, um, why, he, why he's done it, what the basic issues are. And I would suggest that our mainstream media is ill-informed and doesn't ask the right questions. So I think just, you know, keep pushing the information out there and uh, getting the, the awareness. You hear that? Keep up the good work. <laughs> so I would like to hand over to you as well, this oh. very nice plaque of the reminder of even more people getting surveyed. <laughs> no, <laughs> getting online. Sorry. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, <laughs> Thank you very much.